next time in my, in my life, I have, you know, be here. Okay. You're going to see your son? Yes. Great. Great. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> Well, as you know, we're studying in First John in the second half of the first chapter, <clears throat> and we've been uh, <clears throat> started looking last week at uh, um, one of the tests of salvation, uh, which we could simply call the sin test. Uh, we've seen in the first half of the first chapter, uh, what you could call the Christ test, that Jesus is who he said he was, <clears throat> that he is real, he was manifest in the flesh, and now we're looking at the sin test, and just to read... <clears throat> Uh, the last verses of uh, chapter 1 of First John, beginning at verse 5, it says, This then is the message which we've heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, <coughs> he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. <clears throat> we talked about last time about the fact that the world doesn't want to recognize Jesus Christ, <clears throat> certainly doesn't want to recognize the, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior. He declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <clears throat> That's uh, uh, even among those who would say that they admire Christ as a person, as a teacher, as a, uh, a doer of good things. <clears throat> That's something that they can't abide. <clears throat> His declaration that he is the only way to heaven, that if you don't have him, you're not getting in. <clears throat> but that's the truth. That's what he said. <clears throat> if I said, I want to go to New York, but I'm not listening to any map. No map's going to tell me what to do. I think I'm going to go south. <clears throat> I'm not getting to New York by going south. <clears throat> I don't care how many times I go around the world, I'm never going to get to New York by going south. People say they want to get to heaven, but they don't want to follow God's instructions regarding it. They ain't going to get there. <clears throat> the world doesn't like the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the only Savior. <clears throat> and second, the world doesn't want to recognize that it is guilty before God <clears throat> for the violations of his law. <clears throat> In other words, <clears throat> the fact that men and women are sinners our society tries to redefine the facts of, uh, of mankind, uh, oftentimes in psychological terms. Uh, we'd rather talk about people's psychological deficiencies or redefine their problems as a lack of self-esteem uh, or to cast people as victims of society. <clears throat> um, and I'm not saying that those things are not true, but that does not explain the nature of mankind as being sinners. <clears throat> it's not a matter of deprivation or a lack of self-esteem. We've got way, way, way too much self-esteem. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so that's not the problem. But the world will try to define it as anything other than sin. <clears throat> and so that becomes a test of who's a true believer. <clears throat> they not only have the uh, right view of Christ, but they have the right view of sin and particularly of themselves as being a sinner. <clears throat> and uh, <coughs> the tendency of, uh, of unsaved mankind, and unfortunately even the tendency of saved people, <clears throat> is to try to cover it up. When, when a person is made aware of their sinfulness, of their wretchedness, <clears throat> when they begin to feel the pangs of guilt and of shame, the immediate effort of every lost person is to cover it up, to deny it, to explain it away. And when they can't cover it up any longer, to blame shift, to say it's somebody else's fault. Anything but confessing it as sin. <clears throat> the Proverbs 28.13 tells us, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, 
but whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. <coughs> so as long as you will not acknowledge your sin, as long as you would redefine uh, your behavior psychologically or socially, uh, <clears throat> you will not prosper, meaning that you will not prosper before God. You won't have the favor of God. When you confess your sin, when you forsake your sin, then God grants mercy. <clears throat> That's why prior to salvation, somebody must confess and repent. <clears throat> there is no salvation without it. <clears throat> and so, as we saw last time, God has built into mankind a device <clears throat> that we call the conscience, <clears throat> which the Bible tells us is a great gift from God. <clears throat> it is the work of God in the hearts of men. In Romans chapter 2, it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. <coughs> so God has given mankind this wonderful gift of conscience, <coughs> uh, of something to sting them when they're going the wrong way, when they're doing the wrong thing. And last time we looked at uh, in Mark chapter 14 at the story of... <coughs> of Peter and his denial of Christ. Uh, we saw that Christ told Peter, <clears throat> before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And it was pertinent that Jesus told him before the cock crows twice, <clears throat> because <clears throat> we saw that after Peter's first denial, <clears throat> in verse uh, 68 of uh, Mark 14, it says, and he went out into the porch and the cock crew. He heard the first crowing of the rooster after his first denial. That was God's, God's alarm bell going off saying, remember what Jesus told you. Remember that he warned you. He told you that you're going to deny him three times before the cock crows twice. And you just heard the first cock crow and you've already denied him once. It's time to run. It's time to get out of there. It's time to repent. It's time to turn around. And God in his graciousness to us <clears throat> gives us these alarm bells <clears throat> in our life. <clears throat> um, it can come in sermons. It can come in uh, Christian music. It can come in the words of admonition uh, <clears throat> from a, a, a friend where God is trying to reach out to us when we're starting to drift away and say, wake up. It's time to turn and run from what you're doing. <clears throat> and the conscience is one of those things that God gives us. <clears throat> it is the gift from God to tell us when we're going the wrong way. <clears throat> but the person who covers his sin in this life is bringing upon themselves a severe and a painful burden. And they're not going to prosper covering their sin. <clears throat> and in fact, the person who covers his sin in this life, <clears throat> it gets worse because they're going to have it uncovered in the next life. There's going to be a day for all who cover their sin. Jesus himself spoke of it <clears throat> in uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. It says, he began to say in his disciples, first of all, beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets, quote unquote, backroom deals, shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. <clears throat> He's plain, plainly saying here, that the leaven of the Pharisees and leaven, which is yeast, it was a metaphor often employed by Jesus, a metaphor for sin. And he's saying the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees, the sin, the, the outstanding sin of the, of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. Now that Greek word is hypocrisis, and it refers to the acting of a stage player. He, he was saying the Pharisees are actors, they're pretenders. They're pretending to be God's men, but they are not. 
and he warned his disciples about hypocrisy, of pretending to be something that you're not. <clears throat> Jesus said, nothing is covered up that's not going to be revealed. Nothing is hidden that's not going to be known. <clears throat> Whether you have said it in the dark, it's going to be heard in the light. If you whispered it in private, if it was part of a backroom deal, if <clears throat> it's going to be one day proclaimed on the housetops. What an amazing statement. <clears throat> and I've said for many years, no one ever actually gets away with anything. <clears throat> Nobody gets away with anything. The art of the cover-up, <clears throat> the idea of getting away with something, <clears throat> is a fundamental part of our human fallen nature. And it is one of the biggest lies the devil has ever convinced us of. <clears throat> our whole society <clears throat> has fallen for that non-existent hope. <clears throat> Do you look at our government sometimes and wonder how much wrongdoing, how much evil our leaders are hoping to get away with? <clears throat> well, they're not going to get away with any of it eventually. Even if it doesn't come out in this life, it's going to be exposed. <clears throat> Do you look at the injustices and the perversions of our quote-unquote justice system <clears throat> and wonder how much do prosecutors and ju judges and lawyers and even defendants try to cover up and hope to get away with? <clears throat> well, they will not get away with any of it. In the last week, I don't, I don't think I've shared this with any of you yet. <clears throat> the last week of October of last year, 2022, <clears throat> I got a phone call from Richard McLeese. <clears throat> Richard McLeese is the attorney who represented me in my trial <clears throat> back in 2008. <clears throat> and I had not heard from Richard in a very long time, so I was very surprised to get a phone call from him. <clears throat> he called me and he asked me if I wanted him to appear in court for me the following week for a status hearing that had been scheduled in my case, a case that ended in 2008. <clears throat> so I had no idea <clears throat> what he was talking about. And he explained to me that Judge Norgal, who is the judge for my trial, who I believe had been completely biased against me <clears throat> and my co-defendants, and had, in my opinion, completely twisted justice against me, and frankly, our attorneys believed it too because they pointed out and cataloged numerous examples of Norgal's bias when we filed our first appeal. <clears throat> but <clears throat> Richard told me that Judge Norgal had finally retired at 85 years of age. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, he stayed on the bench until he was 85. I wish I could say that's horribly unusual. <clears throat> it, it's not really. I've heard people talk about it before. They believe that it's the love of the power that they have on that position that they just can't give it up until they just can't do it anymore. <clears throat> so Judge Norgal had finally retired at 85 years old at the beginning of October of last year. <clears throat> and the new judge who took over all of Judge Norgal's cases had scheduled status hearings on all Norgal's existing cases. <clears throat> And I then told Richard <clears throat> that I had filed my final appeal, which is called the 2255. I filed my final appeal in 2015. And Norgal had sat on it ever since that time without ever ruling on it. An unheard of seven years of sitting on it without ruling on it. <clears throat> and I said to him, I guess the new judge is going to have to be the one who's going to finally rule on my 2255, Richard then told me, oh no, Norgal did rule on your appeal. He denied it right before he retired. I never got any notice of it. I did not know that that had happened. <clears throat> he told me, well, there's, there's a listing in the docket that says a copy was mailed to you. Never got it. Never got it. Now, I've gotten... Uh, notices from other courts, appeal, appeals courts, etc. I usually get two or three of them within a week's time to make sure that I absolutely got it. Never got anything from Norgal uh, saying that he had denied my appeal. <clears throat> and 
what that resulted in is that the time would run out for me to appeal it to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, <clears throat> that I wouldn't be able to ask for a rehearing before I ever found out about the denial. So <clears throat> my appeals are now totally expired. It's over. <clears throat> for as long as it exists, the U.S. government will count me as a felon with all the notoriety and the suspicions that go along with that label. But folks, Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 16, speaks of the power of an endless life, which is what God granted to me when he gave me eternal life. So I know that long after the U.S. government has vanished, I will still be here. Amen. <clears throat> Their designation along with them, will end. My life is eternal. <clears throat> now, there's no way for me to take the time to catalog for you all the things that we, we learned about how justice was perverted in my case and then covered over by the courts. And that's not even the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is <clears throat> I really think that the people responsible believe that they have gotten away with it. <clears throat> The, the main issue of, of my appeal was put before the courts five different times. And every single time, the courts simply ignored it. Like, I hadn't even said it. They hadn't even addressed it. They didn't, they didn't say, no, you're wrong, or do an analysis and come to a con They ignored it until there was nowhere left for me to go. <clears throat> and I think that they think that they got away with it. But the story's not over yet. <clears throat> Jesus said, you never said anything anywhere. You've never done anything anywhere. You've never cut a, <clears throat> a backroom deal anywhere. <clears throat> You've never made a conspiracy anywhere. <clears throat> You've never tried to cover up anything that's not going to be uncovered. <clears throat> In fact, there's a full record of every unsaved person's sinful life <clears throat> written down by God in what the book of Revelation calls books, which keep an accurate record, an infallible record, an unrelenting record, <clears throat> and a record in which there's not a single omission of sin. And on the basis of that record comes down one day the just and the righteous sentence from God at <clears throat> what the Bible refers to the great white throne judgment <clears throat> that catapults an unrepentant sinner into eternal hell. <clears throat> Folks, God sees absolutely everything. <clears throat> Amen. Take a look at Ezekiel, <clears throat> the Old Testament book of Ezekiel in chapter 8. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 8. This awesome experience that Ezekiel had <clears throat> that demonstrates the depth of God's insight <clears throat> into everything that every person does. <clears throat> Ezekiel 8, beginning at verse number 1, says, and it, <clears throat> and it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me. <clears throat> then I beheld... And lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire, and from, the, from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate, that's the temple in Jerusalem, that looketh toward the north, so he was at the north gate, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. So here we see Ezekiel is taken in a vision by the hand of this angelic creature to Jerusalem, to the temple, which now has an idol sitting at its north gate, which is which provokes God to jealousy that his temple is now the home of an idol. And that tells you just how far the nation of Israel and its religious leadership had fallen at this time. <clears throat> but it gets worse. Look at verse 7. 
And he brought me to the door of the court, this is within the temple, <clears throat> and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the walls round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. These are the elders of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, it's an incense censer, and a thick cloud of incense went up representing prayers to these idols. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. In this vision, God shows Ezekiel the very thoughts of the elders of Israel. That phrase, the chambers of of their imagery. That's talking about what's in their head, what's in their imaginations. God not only sees everything that every person does, he sees what every person thinks. He sees what they imagine. He sees their will, their desires. All of it is recorded. <clears throat> he sees the very thoughts of every person, good and evil. Nothing can be hidden. <clears throat> There will be no secrets. There are no secrets. <clears throat> the secrets that a person covers up are only a secret now, and someday they're going to be fully disclosed. <clears throat> There's only one way, one way to escape the revelation of all your secrets. <clears throat> you might think of it as having gotten away with it, <clears throat> And that is, if you know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, <clears throat> then you can thank him that your secret sins have been erased. <clears throat> they are gone. But I even have to say that those sins, those secrets were still known to God, <clears throat> and Jesus Christ paid for them on the cross. <clears throat> but when you come to Christ, when you dump your self-righteousness, <clears throat> when you dump your religious ideas, when you dump the thought that you can be good enough to deserve heaven, <clears throat> when you dump the idea that you can work your way into heaven, <clears throat> and you humble yourself as a helpless sinner in need of salvation before God, <clears throat> then the Bible tells us he's faithful, he's just, and he cleanses us <clears throat> from our sins. He, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and he cleanses us, and they will not be displayed for all of mankind and the holy angels to see one day at the great white throne judgment of God. <clears throat> that day is coming, <clears throat> the great white throne judgment before God, that day is coming, but those who know Christ as their Savior will not have their sins revealed. They are gone. They are erased by the blood of Christ. But if you're not born again, if you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you're still thinking you can get into heaven by being good enough or <clears throat> by being religious enough or by doing enough good deeds, and the Bible tells us every one of your secrets one day is going to be revealed. <clears throat> God will, in the end, he will judge all sin because all of it is committed against him. You know, King David is a good illustration of that. You remember David's <clears throat> infamous story. He was out on his rooftop, and he, as the king, lived in the palace, so he had the highest rooftop, and he's looking down on all the other rooftops around him, and he sees Bathsheba out on her rooftop bathing herself. And he liked what he saw. <clears throat> he was pleased with it, and he was attracted to her, and he lusted after her. And as you know, he took her for himself. He committed adultery with her, and when she became pregnant, he arranged the death of her husband in an utterly futile attempt to cover it up. <clears throat> David literally broke four of the last five commandments all in one relationship. He broke the commandment not to covet, 
He broke the commandment not to steal. He broke the commandment not to commit adultery. He broke the commandment not to kill. In one relationship, four out of the last five commandments were broken. And even though he had sinned against Bathsheba, and had sinned against her husband, and had sinned against the nation of Israel, and had sinned against his own family, when it finally came down to his repentance, <clears throat> when the prophet Nathan stuck his finger in David's face and said, Thou art the man, here's what he says in Psalm 51, verse 4, looking to God, he says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David recognized that ultimately all sin is against God. <clears throat> He's the absolute holy one who is always offended by every sin. You know, I think sometimes <clears throat> that people may think that God just like sat down one day and decided to come up with some commandments. So oh, this sounds like a good one and this would be a good one. No, that's not what God's commandments are about. What God did is he listed the things that offend him. I'm offended by lying. I'm offend offended by theft, by stealing. I'm offended by people breaking their wedding vows. I'm offended by people killing one another, murdering one another. <clears throat> the commandments are simply a listing of the things that offend God. That's why we can say, even though other people get hurt by our sins, our sins are offenses against God. <clears throat> David didn't deny that he sinned against Bathsheba, that he sinned against Uriah, her husband, that he sinned against the nation of Israel, that he sinned against his own family. <clears throat> but he recognized that in the end, the ultimate heinousness of his sin was that it offended God. It was against God. So that true confession, biblical confession, and this is an important thought here, <clears throat> true confession is not just admitting I've sinned against somebody. <clears throat> it's admitting that sin is always first and foremost against God. When somebody confesses sin to the degree that they, they uncover it and acknowledge that I've sinned against you, God, that's the kind of confession that brings a person to true biblical repentance. Not simply being sorry that they got caught, but being sorry that they have offended God by what they've done. And then, through faith, <clears throat> they receive full forgiveness and blessing. That's salvation. <clears throat> That's repentance to salvation. So people have a choice. All sinners have a choice. <clears throat> you can cover up your sin or you can confess it. And John is showing us that people who belong to God are the ones who confess their sin, and they admit it. The people who don't belong to God are the ones who are constantly trying to cover it up. So in the passage that we read at the beginning in 1 John, <clears throat> confession of sin becomes a test of salvation. <clears throat> As I've been saying to you, there's, there's a number of tests that are going to be in this epistle. There's the test of the doctrine, uh, the right doctrine about Christ, which we've mentioned, <clears throat> that appeared in the first four verses of this chapter, and we'll see again. There's also the test of obedience, which we'll be looking at. There's the test of love, which we'll be looking at. And there's this test of the proper view regarding sin. <clears throat> and John is saying you can always tell a genuine Christian by their view of Christ, and by their view of sin, and by their view of obedience, and by their view of godly love. And if they don't have what the Bible says is a, uh, a sanctified attitude towards these things, a biblical view of these things, then they are not Christians no matter what they claim. It's not what they say. <clears throat> it's how they live. <clears throat> so in this portion of Scripture in 1 John, <clears throat> we've got the <clears throat> test of a true view of sin. <clears throat> And again, I don't want to go into a lot of background because we've talked about it numerous times, but, but John is teaching this against the backdrop of false teachers that are creeping into the church. <clears throat> they've denied the true doctrine of Christ, and they've also denied in one way or, or another, or perhaps several, uh, they've denied their own sin. They neither confess Christ in a true way, and they don't confess their sin either. 
And the word confess, it's a good word. In Greek, it's homologeo. And it means simply to say the same thing as another, to agree with or to assent to. So to confess means to say the same thing that God is saying. If you confess Christ, it means you're saying the same thing about Christ that God says about Christ. If you confess sin, it means you're saying the same thing about sin that God says about sin. But John was dealing with this influence in the churches in Asia Minor where he was ministering <clears throat> with these false teachers who were coming in and saying different things about Christ. They were false teachers presenting another Christ and they were engaging in the denial of the true biblical doctrine of sin. So John is trying to protect the church. <clears throat> That's what we've been seeing. John wants to protect the church and he wants to protect it from this destructive error. And the first step in protecting the church is making sure that everybody knows who's a Christian and who's not. <clears throat> so the first way you can identify a false teacher is to know how to identify a true Christian <clears throat> and tell them from a fake. And it's probably the most important safeguard because false teachers and deceivers and antichrists, they're not true believers. <clears throat> and you need to have some criteria by which to evaluate them. And John makes it clear <clears throat> that one test of genuine salvation deals with the issue of sin. So again, verse 5 <clears throat> says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. He's saying again, we didn't get this from mankind. It came from divine revelation, the gospel message, and the foundation is that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. <clears throat> and we went into some detail about this previously, that the light of God is syn synonymous with the life of God, that God is eternal life. <clears throat> and we saw last time that everything is based on <clears throat> Who has that eternal life? It all starts with God, who grants the eternal life. And in him is no death, no darkness. That's what the darkness refers to. The eternal life that God gives, it is a holy life. <clears throat> it is a true life. So and somebody who has it is going to manifest <clears throat> holiness and manifest truthfulness. <clears throat> So the light aspect of God is simply a way of expressing, demonstrating his life. So we're talking about who has God's life, <clears throat> who has eternal life. That's the point. Since God is light or life and dispenses that life to those who believe, we can know who believes genuinely by seeing that they manifest the essence of that eternal life, which is holiness and truthfulness. <clears throat> That is, they are committed to the truth, to sound doctrine, to godly living. That's the basic truth of what John is saying here. <clears throat> We're talking about who is the light, who has God's divine life. There's a lot of people who claim to be in the light. There are people, verse 6 says, <clears throat> who say they have fellowship with him, which is the same as being in the light, possessing life, sharing life with God, having fellowship with God. It's all the same thing. But these people are claiming to be in the light. <clears throat> By their lifestyle, they demonstrate that they're walking in darkness. And then verse 7 talks about people who actually walk in the light. And that's the distinction. It's not the ones who claim, it's the ones who walk, who are the true believers. Like we've said, <clears throat> your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks more than your talk talks. People in the fellowship have the life of God. They walk in the light of God's life and not in darkness. And anybody who walks in the darkness demonstrates they're not possessors of the life of God <clears throat> because in him is no darkness at all. Now again, it doesn't mean that we don't fail. It doesn't mean that we don't sin. But our lifestyle is bent towards walking with God in his light, with his lifestyle. <clears throat> and when we fail, we're going to get up again. <clears throat> Believers don't fail and stay down permanently. <clears throat> God will drag you back to your feet if need be. Another way to put all this is we're talking about the if we sayers versus the if we doers. <clears throat> James said in 
James 1.22, he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So there's people sitting in churches, hearing the word of God, thinking that they're okay. But they're not because they're only hearers. They are not doers. <clears throat> so don't just be hearers or sayers. <clears throat> you have to be doers. It's not enough to claim you're in the fellowship. You literally have to prove it by your life. And as we've seen, one of the proofs is that genuine believers have abandoned the try-to-get-away-with-it lifestyle. <clears throat> and I've heard preachers describe sin as, uh, among other things, being simply stupid. I mean, one of the best evidences of the stupidity of sin is how people try to deny and cover up their sin, how they try to get away with it. When God makes it so clear that nobody is ever going to get away with anything. I think about this from time to time. Try to imagine the absolute horror of the great white throne judgment as people are confronted in front of all of creation with their secret sins, open and displayed for everyone to see. Aren't you grateful that God's salvation to believers has spared you from that horror? Won't happen to you. You know Christ is your Savior. Won't happen to you. Thank the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be finished for today.